Not an easy passage, thank you Rick, but it's, um, it's interesting that sometimes we try and get away from some of the scriptures because they're quite tricky, especially from 20 onwards. It, Jesus names all these things that, that we do as, as humans, what, what we get up to, and it's quite hard to swallow sometimes that stuff. And if you look at that passage, if you look before it and you look after it and put it in context, it's really interesting what Jesus was doing. He's been going around... Uh, doing different things with his bunch of, of, um, of men, going from different village to different village. Amazingly, people who were blind were receiving sight. People who were deaf were, were hearing again. And there was crowds gathering where, wherever he went. There must have been a real sense of excitement where he was. The lame were walking, captives being set free. I mean, it must have been an incredible time just to be with him and see what he was doing. All that done through the love, through the grace, and through the power of God. And that's what Jesus was showing, as you know, as he walked around. And if you look before this scripture, you can see. It's even just before it is when Peter was challenged about his faith. And Jesus said, get out of the boat and walk towards me. And, and we know what happened there. So he was really challenged. When they got to this village, I was thinking myself, it doesn't say it in the scripture, but they must have been pumped. They must have been really excited about what was happening, seeing Jesus working on the ground, doing this stuff practically. I mean, just we don't see this stuff very often, especially not in, in the UK. In Africa, it happens a lot. Why? I don't know. Maybe more faith, maybe not. But the lame walk, the blind receive their sight, tumors disappear, the dead are raised. It happens. So they must have been seeing this stuff and coming back and being really excited. And wherever Jesus seemed to go, there was this, this sense of expectation, this sense of excitement. They must have been thinking, if you put yourself in their place, goodness, what is he going to do next? Is there nothing this man can't do? Raising the dead? I mean, just to be around him would have been exciting. So they move into the, um, into the next village, not knowing what's going to happen. And they're a bunch of, I don't know, fishermen, different types of, of people, uneducated, quite rough, unkempt, I don't know, difficult at times, and they were hungry. So they must have just grabbed some food, I'm guessing, grabbed a few apples or whatever was lying around, just started eating it as they were talking and chatting and moving along. Also in that village were some of the teachers the serious religious people that knew what was going on. Even some of them had come down from Jerusalem. The big city. Maybe they'd come from London down to somewhere else. They'd, they'd come down to see what was happening with, with Jesus when you go through it. And they were the ones that had studied the law. They were the ones that knew the, um, the holy books really well. They were the ones that prayed every day. They were the ones that went into the, the synagogues every day. There was a, there was a saying that... Um, these Pharisees, these teachers of the law, could get a nail and put a nail through the holy book. And wherever it landed, they could recite the scripture. So they knew exactly all about this stuff. They were experts, experts in the law. And they didn't like what they saw. They didn't like Jesus coming into this village, maybe their village. They didn't like these unkempt men walking around the village, looking pretty rough probably, and a bit shabby, unshaven, a bit scruffy, a bit smelly. And they certainly didn't like what they were doing. They were picking up food and eating it. And they said to Jesus, they challenged him, why are your followers, why are your men breaking the law? Don't they know, don't you know that you have to wash your hands, you have to wash everything, like the reading we've just heard, you have to wash the pots, the kettles, the pans, you have to wash every time you've been out in the open air before you do anything. Otherwise, you're defiled. Now, for me, it's always good. We teach Phoebe, and Amanda's constantly telling me it's good to wash your hands before you eat. Of course it is. But that wasn't the point of this. What they were trying to do, as always, were trying to trick him and trying to get him, get him on something. They were trying to trap him in their arrogance because they knew the law. And who is this young upstart coming into their village, doing what he does and not recognizing them? They were the ones that knew everything. So amazingly, he responds back really quickly. He knew the law. Ironically, it was him that wrote it. So he responds back in verse 6, if you ever look at it in your Bible. 
You honor me in your traditions, but not in your heart. You honor me with the rules of men and your traditions, but not your heart, not what's in here. And that's what God wants. So he challenges them back again. And then he goes on, like I read out in verse 21. It's what comes out of your bodies, out of your actions, out of your character, out of what you do, out of your mind. It's that that makes you unclean. unclean. Not what you eat, not what goes in, because I love it, because he says further on, because that's going to come out. So it's not important about that. It's not that stuff we're talking about. For nearly 40 years, I was... um, a non-believer. I was brought up by my parents really as, as an atheist. Not a God-hater, just irrelevant. We just didn't do God with my mum and dad. And I led a life that was certainly unclean. And I'm not going to go into great detail. I'd be embarrassed. But it was an unclean life in lots of ways. From the outside, I think at many a time it looked, it looked quite good. It looked quite respectable, but not in here. Not, not on the inside. And I'm ashamed to admit that I nearly have a full house with that list that Jesus quotes in verse 21. Nearly a full house of those things. I've done most of them. So I know what being unclean is like. Like I said, for me, my parents were both alcoholics. I grew up in the north of England in Manchester. It was a pretty rough area. We moved a lot. I got in an argument between my mum and dad when I was about 15, 16. My father threw me out. End up living on the streets for a while. Not long, but long enough to to know what it is to to be homeless. I got involved with a gang. I moved into a squat in a place called Stockport and got involved in crime. Wasn't very good at crime at all, so I got caught all the time. That led to a relationship with the police. If you stay with the police, you usually end up in a relationship with the prison service. And I did. I did a short prison sentence in a place called Risley in between Manchester and Liverpool. Came out of there, I went to go home, but my mum and dad had got divorced and moved in with different people and there was no one there, so I didn't know what to do. So for me, long story short, I bummed around for a little while, got some jobs, lived in a, in a bed sit, and uh, I just didn't want to go back to prison. It, it frightened the life out of me, it was a horrible time. So for me, I saw a poster for the army, and uh, without going into great detail, it was a great marketing ad, because it had two soldiers in uniform, The backdrop was mountains with snow on the top, and it was a blue sky, and they were skiing. (laughs) And it said underneath, do you want a life of adventure? And I thought, you know what I do. I want a life of adventure. I want something different than I've got. So I signed up, and I joined the the army. My army career went really well. I did very well in, in in a short time. Uh, without going into that, but it, but it was, I, I loved it. It saved my life. It gave me a family. It gave me uh, some responsibility, taught me self-respect. It gave me self-discipline, and, and it was great. So externally, I was going really well. Internally, it was, it was a nightmare. My, my personal life, again, no, no change. No God. No God with my mum and dad, no God in the prison, and no God in the army. I spent nearly 16 years in the military, and I never met one chaplain. I mean, I wasn't looking for them, but I never met a chaplain. No one came up to me and said, Paul, let's have a chat. Have you ever looked at the Bible? Do you know anything about God? Nothing. Nobody evangelized to me. Nobody told me the word of God. 16 years in the military. That's four tours of Northern Ireland, uh, a trip down to the Falklands, and, and various other things. No padre, no God, no nothing. So my life in the military fell into just a mess, a shambles. I was married and divorced, married and divorced, two divorces, two marriages, too much drink. From being bullied, I became a a fighter, really. I turned into my father, actually, in in lots of ways. So my life was full of sort of drink, despair, and divorce. That was it. But externally, it looked really well. I was pretty... I looked pretty good in the uniform. I made sergeant pretty quickly, and, um, and everything looked fine. But in the inside, uh, just, a, just a mess. It's what's inside that's so important. I came out of the army, uh, moved in with my girlfriend, Amanda. And, uh, and for, for eight years, uh, we, we, were doing, we were doing okay, actually. We were doing all right. Good jobs, both of us. Had all the toys, nice house, and all that sort of thing. But still... For me, personally, just unsatisfied, just restless all the time, looking for something but not knowing what it was. Long story short, 
we went on an Alpha course. And um, for me, Amanda can say her own story about Alpha, but for me, on the weekend away, a few things had happened before that, but on the weekend, I met with God. And, and I say it's, it was a shock, probably for both of us. Because I, was, I didn't think God would accept anyone like me with my background. This, again, for the context of the scripture, this unclean person. Why would God want someone like me? He wants nice people like you, but, but not someone like me with my background. So I became a Christian on, on, on the Alpha course, and I realized that my life had to go in a complete different direction. And God started putting people around me that started to change me. Sandy Miller was my vicar at the time and really helped me and mentored me and still does. Nikki Gumble, Nikki and Scylla Lee, Rick and Louie. Just other people around me, especially men around me that I could start to model off and look at their lives and watch them. And I still do and see, see what they're like and what they do. And God started to change me slowly, started to put these people around me that helped me. And my heart and my mind started to change. Married my girlfriend, Amanda. We've been together now a long time. I got my son back, Clinton, for my first marriage. I left him when he was three and just divorced and left him. I got him back in my life. He's 34 now and I see him, I see him most days. Amazing, amazing young man. I've got a daughter, Phoebe. And my life is a lot better than it was before when I knew, before I knew God. 97, I went on staff uh, as a pastor at HTB, as Rick said. 2002, I was ordained after doing three years theology. And then Sandy Miller asked if I'd come back as a curate to, to HTB. And, I, and I've been there ever since. I got involved in prisons. A lady called Emmy Wilson, you might know. is a very powerful woman. Be careful when you pray with her. But we prayed, and she said, I think you should come on a prison visit. And I said, thank you very much, but no. So uh, most of my life stay out of prison. Why on earth would I want to go back in one again? And I went back in a visit, in a prison, did a visit, and again, my life changed direction. I just thought, you know what, this Alpha course might work well in a prison environment, and it's grown. Not through anything I've done, but it's, uh, but it's grown. So I spend most of my time now working in prisons and running this charity, uh, the William Wilberforce Trust. But mostly it's prison work. Uh, that's the scripture that was given to me, Isaiah 61, 1 to 3, about setting the captives free. And it hit me, and it's lodged in my heart. And it won't go away. So I spend my time with what these Pharisees would call the unclean people in this scripture. Prisoners, ex-offenders, homeless, the sick, the mentally ill, addicts, those caught in the sex industry, those uh, in debt, orphans, widows, those sort of things. I have a team based at uh, St. Augustine's, which is one of the sites Rick thought about. And we work from there and we try and do all that stuff. I guess those like me that were, were lost that are struggling with, with stuff, just get caught in stuff. Whether it's their fault or a set of circumstances, whatever it is, they're just stuck and they can't get out. And what we can do as a church is we can help them just give them a foot on the first ladder and, and let them start climbing and helping themselves. And for me, I don't know if I'm right or if I'm wrong, but when we stand before God, like the Bible says that we will all stand before him and we will have to give an account of our lives, what we've done. Personally, I don't think he's going to say, did you wash your hands every day, Paul? Did you pray every morning, Paul? Did you put something in the collection plate every time it went around, Paul? Did you go to church every Sunday, Paul? Did you read the Bible every day, Paul? You know what, I don't think he's going to say that to me. Important that those things are for our faith to grow and for us to be discipled and mature in the faith. Of course, they're really important, but they're not essential. That's what I get out of this scripture. They're not the essential things for following Jesus. It's not what goes in, it's what comes out that is important. What you do with your time. That's the most important thing. So he might not ask us if we washed our hands every day or if we read the Bible and done all that stuff, but he may probably ask us, did you do what I asked you to do? Did you look after the sick? Did you help the widow and the orphan? Did you love your neighbor? Did you visit me when I was in prison? Did you feed me when I was hungry? Did you give me water when I was thirsty? Did you clothe me when I was naked? Did you love your wife or your husband? Are you pouring out 
your life for the sake of others? Are you being a servant like I asked you to be? Now, I think he may ask us those things, and that's for you to ponder and for you and me to work out. Those are the questions that we should think about. Those are the questions that keep me awake at night sometimes, thinking about that stuff, how I can spend my time, the resource that God has given me. How, how can I do that? When I went to the, into that prison in 97, I felt the call of God on me, definitely, and I've never doubted it since. I doubt every single day if I'm capable of doing it, every single day, but I don't doubt that he called me to do that. That's what I think this passage is saying to us. So two years ago, we started a charity at HDB called the William Wilberforce Trust. And it was put together, really, to help those caught in injustice and the poor and the marginalized and the sick and that list that I I read out. It grew out of a church. It's based in a church. It's in a local church. I know HDB is a bit bigger than that now, but it's, it's, it's rooted, and I wanted it to be rooted in this church. That's why I said I'd look after this church, St. Augustine's, as long as this charity can be in it and come out of it. Otherwise, it, it's not going to have the power that it has. And it focuses on, on, on social transformation, not on religion, completely different than what this passage is. And it's trying to help people one at a time. Working with the homeless, working with um, those excluded from work, employability. We run a a little scheme in a warehouse in Chiswick, 16-week course, where we try and get men and women back into work. If they're ex-offenders or they're homeless or they've just been long-term unemployed or just stuck. Or those people that we all know that seem to be unemployable, but they're not all the time. They just need some help and some training. The prisons and caring for ex-offenders that we prayed for. Debt advice. We run a money course and we also run a debt counselling service. Recovery from addiction, those caught in drug and alcohol abuse. Dealing with depression, victims of trafficking, those caught in the sex industry. Whether it's domestic servitude, where passports are taken off, these people that come over and, and, and clean and look after wealthy people's houses, or it's those caught in, in, in brothels or prostitution, we look after them. Trying to build a community for older people, single parents, a new ID course, which is working with people stuck with eating disorders, which are horrendous, men and women, and working with vulnerable children. Trying to encourage churches that they can do respite care. Do you know that I think it's about 5,000 or 6,000 um, children are waiting for, for uh, adoption, immediate adoption. And you know the seven and a half, nearly 8,000 Alpha churches in the UK? Quick thought there, if every single church took one child, we'd scrub the list overnight like that. So we try and encourage churches that they can maybe help with respite care or even fostering an adoption. And all that work has had um, great favor, nothing that I've done. I'm just the one that scribbles ideas on bits of paper and then the team is, is amazing that, that the God has put around uh, and uh, Nikki helped me facilitate that at the church. But it's been amazing, it's had great favour. And one of the areas that has had great favour, and Rick mentioned it, so I'll finish on that, is the prison work. It's been extraordinary what's happened in in the UK now. Out of 155 prisons in the UK, Alpha's in 130 of them. And has been since 97, really, it's been growing. So it's the main form of evangelism in our prisons in, in the UK. And it's got credibility and it's growing in, and thousands upon thousands of men and women have come to Christ by reading the Bible, by doing an Alpha course and coming out. And the other thing we wanted to do on the other side of that is then encourage churches, including our own, to help when those men and women come out so that we can give them accommodation, that we can help them with employment, that we can start mentoring them, that we can start reintegrating them back in society. And your church is a CFE church, so it's, so it's great. I'm very excited. More churches need to come on board and say, you know what? We'll be willing to be trained, and, and, and we want to help, and we'll take someone in, and we'll meet them at the gate, and, and we'll put them in this community, and we'll sit them in the middle, and, and we'll help them. And you know what? It works. We're working with the government now, with, with NOMS, National Offenders Management Scheme, the prison system, and, and they've given us a little bit of money, which is amazing, actually, to encourage us to get churches They like to call them communities, and I said, you can call them what you want. They're churches. So they've given us some money to to encourage churches to come on board. This is the prison service. Why? I'd like to say because they're they're people of faith and they're they're excited about spiritual things, but it's not that. It's financial. 
because reoffending costs the UK over 14 billion pounds a year, and it's rising. 14 billion it costs reoffending. It costs a staggering amount of money to keep people in prison. And what we've been doing, the reoffending rate in the UK is about 80%. Eight out of 10 men will be in prison within two years. It's, that's a, a, a fact. It's not me saying it. Those that have gone through Alpha, those that want to change their life, those that are met at the gate and go through the charity caring for ex-offenders, those who let us help them all over the UK, the reoffending rate is down to 25%. And that has got the government's attention. And it's not rocket science. It's really quite easy. All we need is more churches to come on board. We've got about 700, but it's not enough out of 8,000 Alpha churches. That's why I'm excited that you're one of them. Churches like you to come on board and say yes, and then we'll get more, and then we can link people. And when they come out of prison and say, I want to I go to the East End, I can say, you know what, there's a great church that is trained up, ready to help you, ready to welcome you, put your, them in their community and love you and help you sort your life out. That's what's changing people. And that's what is exciting. And that system has started to grow around the world. We're now working in 75 countries around the world uh, within the prison systems. And the Care Infects Offenders charity, which I just mentioned, is now in six and possibly starting in Lusaka, where I've just come back from last night. So seven countries are running the charity, which is brilliant. It's just great favor. And the Lusaka prison where I was in yesterday, it's very odd coming out of there with, with flight travel now and being stood here and where I was yesterday morning. But I've just come out of there and I had an opportunity to, to go back. We went a few months ago and we did a little, uh, some gap training there and took a team. And I went into this prison, the Lusaka Central Prison. And it is horrendous. It is the worst prison I've ever seen. And I've been in about 30 countries in Africa now and traveled around the world and seen a lot of prisons. And this was the worst one. And it hit me again. And, and, I, and I was angry about the conditions. Right, righteously angry, I hope, but angry about the conditions. And I wanted to, to do something. While I was there, I, I met, the first time we met, I met a man in there called Paul Swarley. And I'll show you a couple of pictures in a minute. Paul Swarley was, was a man that was, was in the prison. A few years ago, they had a coup in, in, uh, in Zambia, and the military tried to take over the government, and it, and it failed, dramatically failed. And 30 soldiers were arrested. In fact, 60 soldiers were arrested from that coup, officers, sergeants, and, and ordinary ranks, and they were put into to prison. 30 of them were condemned to death. One of those people that was condemned to death was, was this chap I, I now know called Paul Swarley. Paul Swali was condemned to death, and while the trial was getting together and getting all the facts, 30 of them were put on death row. Now, death row in this prison, which you'll see in a minute, is even worse than what I saw. There's a tiny little cell that was built for 34, and there was 300 people waiting to be hung. They still have the death penalty in, in Zambia, waiting to be hung, Paul Swali being one of them. In the prison, there's a tiny, tiny, tiny little room that they call the library. It's just two chairs with some books on. In that library, I don't know how, there was a book, Questions of Life. Nicky Gumbel's book, Questions of Life. How it got in there, I have no idea. He doesn't know how it got in there. He picked it up and he read it. And as he read it, long story short, he gave his life to Christ just reading the book and became a Christian. And the bit in there, the bit of scripture that stuck with him, it says that all things are possible with God. I can't remember where that is in the Bible, but he read that and he said, if all things are possible, then I don't want to die. I don't want the death penalty. I don't want to die. Amen. They were sentenced. They went to court to receive their sentencing. The 30 of them stood there, and the judge called all the names out, one at a time, and, and said, sentence to life, sentence to death, sentence to life, sentence to death, sentence to life. Paul Swarley, you are free to go. And I was with Paul yesterday, and he said to the judge, Pardon? Paul Swali, you are allowed to go. Go and do what you have to do. And he got up and he walked out of the prison. And he was free. The rest of them are still in prison. They've not been hung. They're on death row. He was set free. All things are possible with God. Now what he is now is the Alpha for Prisons coordinator. And goes in that prison every single day. Because he said he would serve God if God set him free. And the last time I was in there, I was speaking, preaching to, to the men. And he was translating for me. And to see him stood there, who's been on death row, who's been in that prison for two years and on death row, in a shirt and a tie, smart, trousers, shoes polished, 
preaching the word of God. That is such a dramatic picture of hope. And they can see, and he preaches, with God, all things are possible. And it's amazing what's happening there. There's a thousand men in this prison now gone through the Alpha Course. And 300 men, 300 women have gone through the Alpha Course. Now this prison that you're going to see in a minute was built in 1934. And it was built for 150 men. When I was in there yesterday, the day before yesterday, it's got 1,300 men in it. So the little rooms that were built for 20 to 25 men, I've got 80 to 125 men lying in them. If you put the first picture up. This is, the, this is in the courtyard. There's 1,300 men in this prison that was built for, um, for, for 200. The next picture shows you the conditions. That's how they sleep in the cells. So the cells are so small. These are, these, I'm not trying to just make you go, oh, I'm just showing you what this prison is like. They lie side by side like that. In fact, when they sleep in the cells, they go, get put in at 4 o'clock in the afternoon and they come out at 7 a.m. In, in the morning. You can imagine the heat. It was very hot when I was out there. And they sit, they get stacked in. So they start off as if you're in a rowing position. So they sit on the floor, the next one sits there, next one sits there, and they stack them like that. And in the middle of that little cell, which is tiny, is, is their toilet. So they die in there of tuberculosis, they die of AIDS, and they die of all sorts of things. And that's how they end up trying to sleep. And, and I've seen that picture, it's true picture, of, of that cell. Next picture. So we went out, and last time I went, I got so angry. And, and one of the inmates that, that uh, preached, has an amazing story, I haven't got time to tell you, but one of the inmates that preached said, what we need is some, we need some mattresses, uh, and we need some blankets, uh, and we need some uh, medicated soap, because there's no water every other day. They cut the water off, so there's no water, so they need medicated soap to help with the diseases. And the women I went to see, they, they, they wanted a cooker because they've been teaching them um, cooking skills, but there's no cooker. It's broken and they can't afford it. And some of the women wanted to repair their, their clothes, so they wanted a sewing machine. So I came back here and I spoke to a few people, and uh, amazingly, through the grace of God, they said, how much do you want? And, and, and a few people gave me some money, and we went back and we bought that. Those on the left there, if you can see them, are 300 mattresses. Uh, on, the white, on the right, in the white um, packages, uh, our blankets, there's a cooker there, there's um, hundreds of, of, anyway, it's just going back in there and helping them. Next picture. That's what we gave to, to the women as well. We also, um, like I said, one of the funny things that we did, I took Amanda and Phoebe with me to that prison. Phoebe's never been in a prison in her life and I ended up taking her to the worst one in the country, I think. But it was amazing and, and uh, it's had an effect on her. Um, Linus, the chaplain, the female chaplain, said to Amanda and Phoebe, one of the things that we don't get is the, the women, um, they need, I don't know how to say it the other way, they need some knickers. Um, so um, they told Amanda and Phoebe that, and I, um, I came back, and I asked the church on a Sunday, Queensgate, I said, um, I know this might seem a bit odd, but I've just been to prison, and there's, there's, uh, we need some knickers. If, if you could give me some knickers, that would be really good. Anyway, Amanda got up as well and said, you know, we need some underwear for the women. We got nearly 600 packs of, of underwear, and, uh, and I took them out. And I was going to ship them out, but it was so expensive on UPS to get them out there, and I didn't want to waste the money that I'm given. We bought a suitcase for £34 off the North End Road, and I took 600 pairs of knickers out in my, in my luggage. And my main prayer was, please, Lord, don't let me get stopped at customs. Because <laughs> I was thinking, as they go, Reverend Cowley, could you just tell us why you've got 600 pairs of ladies' underwear in your... Uh... <laughs> through the grace of God, we got through, and we gave it to them. And just something you can't really see, it, but on the left-hand edge of the screen, right on the edge, is a little white bit. There's, that's a massive bin bag full, full of underwear. And, and the women were just weeping. They, they, couldn't, they, they just couldn't believe that you, the church... I'd given so generously to do that. Something that you can do practically just like that. That they brought them in. So a thousand people done the Alpha through the grace of God. 300 women done the Alpha course. Um, that's what, what we did. Next one. To finish with, that, that is a, a shot of some of the guys. You can see uh, the condition. And um, 
And one of the things we wanted to do at the end, I asked Paul Swally, who works in there, you know, about some, how, can we, how can we help some of the guys? And I got an opportunity to meet with the vice president of, of Zambia, a guy called Guy Scott, and we talked and we put a little thing together and they want us to help with the prisons and we just formed a partnership out there with different stakeholders and, and the vice president's going to put his name to it and it was really exciting. But in that prison there was people held in there because their visas have run out. One of them for two and a half years. That means they come from Sierra Leone or India or, um, I don't know, all over the place. So different parts of Africa and they try and get into Zambia. They might get in a bit of trouble, they get in prison and then their visas run out then they can't get out. So they might have a short sentence but they won't allow them out because they need a visa. Uh, and they come from all over the place. Burundi. And what we did, I, I, I phoned a couple of people up and I said, I said to Paul Swali, I said, so these people... It's 27 of them. These 27 people that are in there held because of, of visa violation. Can they get out? He said, yes, but you know, they, they need $70 to get them out. So I said, they've been in there for one of them for two and a half years in that hell hole because they can't get $70. He said, yes. So what we did, I phoned a couple of friends up and said, you, you've got to help me. We, we've got to do this. And some of them, those in the front there, not, not all of them, but some in the front, are being released on Monday morning. We've got the visas, they've all been signed off by immigration, we've paid the money, and the 27 of them are gonna walk out of that gate Monday morning free and go back to their own countries. How did that happen? Through the generosity of people. It's not what goes in, it's what comes out that's important, it's what, it's what we do. It's what we do with our time, what we do with our thoughts, our actions, what we can do for others, that's important. Not what we drink, how we drink it, how we eat, how we wash our hands. I think that's the essence of what Jesus is saying in this scripture. What are you doing? You're missing the point. It's not about that stuff. It's about what you do. Are you doing what I asked you to do? That's what makes us clean or unclean in the sight of God. And that, for me, gives us this amazing opportunity just to engage in what God's doing in any form or shape. I or Rick can't tell you what to do, or Louis can't tell you what to do. God will tell you what to do with the resources and the time and the vision and the passion that he's given to you individually and of the church. And you can make an amazing difference. I, I, I can't believe those 20-odd people walking out of that prison. I spent time in that prison. And they're walking out of there through the generosity of the church to set them free and get them out. And that's what it says in Isaiah 61, doesn't it? 1 to 3. We are called to set the captives free, whether they're in prison, whether it's drinking alcohol, whether it's eating disorders, whether it's mental illness, whether it's just whatever it is. We are called to set the captives free, and that's what we can do. Can we pray?